Imagine standing on the windswept plains of prehistoric Africa, millions of years ago, where the first flickers of what we'd call human intelligence sparked amid a world teeming with danger. Predators lurked in the shadows of ancient forests, massive herbivores thundered across savannas, and the sky was a vast, uncharted dome. But here's the twist that hooks you. You weren't alone. Not by a long shot. Dozens of human-like species roamed the earth, each carving out their niche in a brutal, unforgiving landscape. Some climbed trees like acrobats, others wielded fire like gods, and a few even braved treacherous seas to claim isolated islands. Today, we're the last ones standing. But how did we get here? Buckle up, because we're diving deep into the prehistoric saga of human evolution, a story of survival, innovation, and extinction that spans continents and eons. By the end, you'll see why our ancient relative struggles mirror our own, in ways that might just change how you view humanity. Let's journey back to the dawn of our genus and uncover the forgotten branches of our family tree. To truly grasp this epic tale, we need to rewind to the very roots of what makes a human. Picture a world without rigid boundaries. Nature doesn't care about our neat labels. Back then, the line between one species and another was as blurry as a misty prehistoric morning. Scientists grapple with this even today. The classic idea? If two creatures can mate and produce fertile kids, they're the same species. But think about it. Lions and tigers, those majestic beasts prowling ancient grasslands, could hybridize into ligers or tigons. Yet no one calls them the same animal. Their differences in size, stripes, and roars scream separate. Now apply that to fossils buried under layers of earth for millions of years. We can't test breeding in a lab. We're left with bones, teeth, and tools as clues. That's why experts juggle up to 26 definitions of a species, depending on what's available. DNA snippets, skull shapes, or even behavioral hints from artifacts. In prehistoric times, this fluidity meant evolution was a slow dance, not a sudden leap. Mutations accumulated like rain filling a river, gradually forming new groups. No dramatic first human moment, just a continuum of change in response to ice ages, droughts, and shifting ecosystems. This messiness fuels endless debates in paleoanthropology. Is that jawbone from a new species or just a variant? Understanding this sets the stage for our story, reminding us that human evolution wasn't a straight highway, but a tangled web of paths through ancient wildernesses. Our journey begins in the cradle of humanity, East Africa, around 2.8 million years ago. The landscape was a mosaic of woodlands and open grasslands where early hominins forged under the relentless sun. The oldest hint of our genus Homo is a humble jawbone, blending traits from ape-like australopithecines and something more, us. But the star of this era is Homo habilis, emerging around 2.5 million years ago. These handy humans were pint-sized pioneers, standing about as tall as a modern child, with brains 40% larger than their predecessors, around 600-700 cubic centimeters, enough to spark ingenuity. Imagine them huddled around riverbanks, chipping stones into Oldowan tools, crude choppers for slicing meat from scavenged carcasses or cracking nuts from thorny trees. This wasn't just survival, it was the dawn of technology in a world ruled by fangs and claws. They walked upright but scampered into branches when saber-toothed cats prowled, blending bipedalism with arboreal agility. My take? Homo habilis represents the ultimate underdog story. Small, vulnerable, yet clever enough to outwit bigger threats. Their tools weren't fancy, but they symbolized a shift. From reacting to the environment to shaping it, Analysts argue they might be the rootstock for all later humans, persisting until about 1.5 million years ago, even as descendants evolved. In a prehistoric setting, their legacy whispers through the rustling leaves. Innovation starts small. Around the same time, another contender enters the scene, Homo rudolfensis, striding across the same African terrains. 
larger than Habilis with brains up to 750 cubic centimeters and a more robust build, they might have descended from a shared ancestor or even been a variant. But here's where analysis gets juicy. Their archaic features, like a flatter face, suggest they were an evolutionary side quest, not the main path. Picture them competing for resources in lush rift valleys, perhaps clashing over prime foraging spots. They didn't leave behind groundbreaking tools, but their size hints at a life less tree-bound, more grounded in open pursuits. In my view, Rudolf Ensis embodies nature's experimentation. Not every branch thrives, but each teaches us about adaptability in volatile climates. They faded early, but their presence underscores the diversity buzzing in prehistoric Africa, where multiple hominins shared the stage like actors in a grand, unscripted drama. Fast forward to two million years ago, and the plot thickens with Homo ergaster, the true trailblazer. Towering like modern humans, they roamed vast savannas from Africa outward, their long legs built for endurance trekking. Brains averaged 850 cubic centimeters, fueling the Acheulean revolution. Hand axes shaped with precision, flaking off layers to create teardrop tools for butchering megafauna, like early elephants. Envision ergaster bands migrating along river corridors, napping stones by firelight. Wait, fire? Not yet controlled but their tools sliced deeper, lasted longer. Often lumped with Homo erectus as a subspecies, Ergaster was the African vanguard, birthing lineages that conquered the world. Personally, I see them as the engineers of prehistory. Their innovations weren't just about survival, but efficiency, allowing more time for social bonds. In a world of seasonal floods and famines, this edge meant thriving where others faltered. Speaking of conquest, Homo erectus steals the spotlight as the first global nomads. By 1.8 million years ago, they'd fanned out from Africa to Eurasia, braving icy tundras and tropical jungles. Subspecies adapted everywhere. Smaller-brained ones in Georgia's highlands, larger ones on Java's volcanic shores. Brains ranging from 600 to 1,250 cubic centimeters. They mastered fire around 1 million years ago, huddling in caves to cook meat, ward off predators, and forge communities. Spears for hunting, clothing from hides, even primitive art etched on shells. These were Renaissance humans of the Stone Age. Crossing seas to islands? That's audacious, implying rafts or swimming in choppy waters. My analysis, Erectus's success lay in versatility. Isolated populations diverged, mirroring how modern cultures adapt, but in prehistoric isolation. They endured for over a million years, ancestors to nearly all later species, proving that exploration was key in a fragmented world. But not all paths led forward. Enter Homo antecessor, haunting Western Europe's forests 1.2 million years ago. With a mix of primitive and advanced traits, brains around 1,000 cubic centimeters, they wielded simple tools in woodland hunts. Yet, they're seen as a dead end, vanishing by 800,000 years ago. Think of them as a cautionary tale. Even promising lineages could fizzle in Europe's harsher climates. Their story adds depth to the narrative, showing evolution's ruthlessness. The Middle Pleistocene, from 800,000 to 300,000 years ago, was the muddle in the middle, a chaotic interlude of overlapping species amid ice ages. In Europe's misty valleys, Homo heidelbergensis emerged around 600,000 years ago, stocky builds and brains up to 1,390 cubic centimeters. Descended from Erectus, they refined hand axes at sites like Boxgrove, crafting wooden spears throwable over 100 feet. Coordinated hunts, possible language, they elevated group dynamics, ancestors to Neanderthals. In Africa, Homo bodoensis, once called Rhodocensis, paralleled this, less stocky, with modern-like traits in early hafting attaching stone points to shafts 500,000 years ago. Our direct forebears, they navigated arid plains with advanced tech. Commentary here. This era highlights parallelism, similar pressures yielding convergent solutions, like how birds and bats both evolved flight. Prehistoric humans weren't isolated, they were part of a global experiment in intelligence.
Around 300,000 years ago, the story explodes with distinct species. Neanderthals, in Europe's glacial fringes, were burly survivors, shorter, muscled, brains averaging 1,450 cubic centimeters. They pioneered Levallois tools for sharp flakes, then Mousterian for versatile kits. Burial rituals? Art with pigments? They weren't brutes. Evidence shows care for the injured, complex societies in cave shelters. My insight? Neanderthals challenged stereotypes. Their tech rivaled ours until late, suggesting cultural exchange where ranges overlapped. Meanwhile, in Africa's sun-baked expanses, Homo sapiens arose from Bodoensis stock. Anatomically modern, rounded skulls, lighter frames, brains organized for abstract thought. From East and South Africa, they spread tentatively to the Middle East. Our weird build, less muscle, more brain, tied to cooperation, not brute force. Analysis. This shift enabled symbolic thinking, art, and planning, setting us apart in a world of muscle-bound kin. South Africa's caves hid Homo naledi, a puzzle. Small brains, 500 cubic centimeters, but modern structure, bodies blending climbing prowess with walking. Remains in deep chambers suggest deliberate disposal, early ritual. They coexisted with us, eating plants, possibly using tools. This flips scripts. Big brains aren't everything. Niche mastery mattered in prehistoric niches. Eastward, Denisovans roamed Asia's steppes and mountains, known from DNA in caves like Denisova. Similar to Neanderthals, brains likely large, range vast. Homo longi, the dragon man skull from China, 1,420 cubic centimeters, might be one, archaic yet advanced. If linked, it expands their story. Adaptable Asians descending from Erectus, hybridizing with locals. On isolated islands, wonders unfolded. Homo floresiensis, the hobbits of Flores, dwarfed to meter tall via insular dwarfism. Scarce resources shrinking giants, enlarging small fry. Brains chimp sized 380 cubic centimeters, yet they hunted many elephants with tools, used fire. From erectus migrants crossing seas one million years ago, they endured until 50,000 years ago. Parallel on Luzon, Homo luzonensis, small, tree adapted, butchering rhinos with basic tools. Arriving 750,000 years ago, their fragmentary bones hint at convergent island evolution. These tales aren't abstract, let's ground them with real-life echoes. Consider the Schoningen spears from Germany, 300,000 years old. Heidelbergensis hunters thrust them into horses, coordinating like modern teams. Or the Rising Star Cave in South Africa, where Naledi bones piled up. Imagine a prehistoric funeral procession, torchlit, mourning kin in echoing darkness. In Indonesia, Floresiensis's Liangbua Cave holds butchered stegodon bones, evoking communal feasts under starry skies. These vignettes make prehistory vivid. Our ancestors face loss, triumph, and community, much like a family surviving a modern disaster, bonding through shared hardship. Other whispers of species, like Cyprinensis, likely Heidelbergensis, or Red Deer Cave Folk, possibly hybrid sapiens, remind us Asia's untapped fossils could rewrite counts. Currently, 13 valid species, peaking at 7-plus concurrent around 300,000 years ago. A mosaic world of intermingling paths. The takeaway? In this prehistoric odyssey, diversity was strength, but unity propelled us forward. Our ancestors' innovations, from Habilis's first tools to Sapiens' symbolic minds, teach resilience amid change. Today, as the sole survivors, let's honor that legacy, embrace curiosity, cooperate across divides, and remember, we're all echoes of those ancient wanderers. What branch of this tree fascinates you most? Drop a comment, and until next time, keep exploring the past to shape the future.